the Museum of Arts and Design uh, sits on the south side of Columbus Circle uh, in New York City, and it's uh, quite a beautiful building. Uh, when I took the idea, I was still at the New York Times at the time, when I took the idea of creating a department of olfactory art uh, to them, Holly Hotchner, who is the director of the museum, said something that I thought was very interesting. She liked the idea, everybody liked the idea, but for very, very different reasons. Uh, David McFadden, who's the chief curator, found it interesting because uh, he said this is a new way of talking about art, it's a, it's, a, it's a new medium, it's a new method of design, the design of perfumes, of works of olfactory art. And Holly's comment was, in the years that I've been working in art and in the art world, I have seen a transformation in the way that people view uh, photography. Photography, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, was absolutely not seen as an artistic medium. Today it is. So what happened during that time? What happened was our understanding of this medium transformed, and it was understood that photography was uh, uh, an artistic medium. One of the uh, central uh, aspects of the Department of Olfactory Art, of which I'm very, very pleased to be the curator. It's sort of the natural step after the New York Times. I was an art critic at the Times. The premise of my job there was that perfume is art, that these are works of olfactory art that are created by artists, and they deserve an intelligent criticism. This is the next step. This is the first department devoted entirely to olfactory art, not to any visual representation, not to bottles and packaging and anything that has to do with sight, only with the sense of smell. Painting, film, photography, these are art forms that speak to the sense of sight. Music, to the sense of hearing, and scent, perfume, to the sense of smell. We're going to look at three great works of art. These are not the, the greatest works of art. This is not the greatest hits. Uh, these are three works that I've chosen very, very specifically to discuss the similarities in aesthetic schools in perfume and uh, in other artistic media, all right? If you are going to, as I hope to, establish uh, olfactory art as an art form equal to painting, to dance, to music, then a very logical place to start is with Jiki. 1889, the artist is Emile Yarlin, and Yarlin was of an era in Paris, uh, which was uh, the really sort of the haute bourgeoisie, turn of the century. It's very interesting, uh, the Eiffel Tower was also completed in 1889, and there were things that were happening that were new all over. One of the interesting things here is that there were two artists who essentially created scent as a medium. One was uh, Emile Galin, and the other was Paul uh, Parquet. And Paul Parquet was actually the first olfactory artist to use synthetics. And Galin was the second. And Jiki is the greatest, probably the paradigmatic work of olfactory neoclassicism and romanticism. Remember the era in which he lived. Uh, Chopin had lived in the first half of the 1800s, and Chopin had brought, obviously, oral uh, romanticism with him. Keats, Byron, romanticism in literature. Um, obviously, there was Delacroix, Ingres and Delacroix, who were vicious rivals. Uh, Ingres, the king of neoclassicism, of detail, of form, of all the formalistic techniques. You can smell in this work traditional French perfumery, the structure of what had come before. But you can also smell the romanticism. There is a sweep to this perfume that's fascinating. And the key to it were two molecules that were synthetics. You can't smell them overtly, but the genius of Jiki is that it freed the olfactory artist from nature. 
all art is artificial in the very best possible sense. Art must manipulate the viewer. It must force the viewer to have an experience, to feel something. The artist has to say, I am going to make you feel fear, joy, anger, shock, loneliness. Look at the difference between a Renoir and a Francis Bacon. Both painting, both utterly different experiences. All right? So this is the first olfactory art. This is a paradigm. This is very, very interesting because, again, it freed the perfumer from nature. The second work, we're going to go from 1889 to 1921. What is interesting about Chanel number no. 5 is what's interesting about every aesthetic school that ever came before. We take them for granted. We understand, we say, oh yes, of course, Chanel number no. 5. You say, oh yes, of course. Um, now at this point, I don't know, we're pro there are probably some kids out there who are saying, oh yeah, Radiohead, <laughs> you know? Um, and at the time, these things are new, but they become accepted and they change the way we see things. I was reading um, a wonderful article on T.S. Eliot and modernism when I was flying over here in The New Yorker by uh, uh, Louis Menand, and, uh, who's brilliant brilliant writer, and Luke was writing about modernism, and he said uh, that modernism takes the traditional form and it conserves it, in particular T.S. Eliot did this, but it twists it, it makes it different, it makes it conform to something that makes you look at everything that's come before differently and that will influence everything that comes after. Now, this is Chanel number five, do you know what's so different about the structure? There's something fundamentally different with Jiki. It's difficult to understand because it's from a different era. It's not our era, but it's great enough that it's still here. Number one, because of the quality of the raw materials. The quality that Chanel uses are spectacular, very expensive. They're wonderful. That's one of the reasons that it has stayed around. But what's fascinating about what Ernest Beau did is that in 1921, he created the world's first great modernist work of art. All right? Who's another great modernist? I would choose, as an example, Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe created the Bauhaus School, also the International School. And what van der Rohe did was he took uh, new raw materials, new technologies. He used new forms of steel. He used tempered glass. And he created something called the curtain wall, the famous glass box. And how he did this was, of course, he used a steel structure on the inside, and he took away the walls. And we think, oh, the glass box. I live in New York City, the Seagram's building on Park Avenue, I see it all the time, and you think, oh, you know, that's fine, that's nice. At the time, it was an absolute revolution. One of the reasons, uh, probably the principal reason was, Mies and his other architects of the era, uh, era Gropius and the Corbusier, but Mies in particular, I think, took away any visual cue to the structure. He disappeared the walls, and he put all the weight inside. And if you look at uh, uh, most of the buildings, and I'll use the Seagram's uh, again as an example, the inside structure is not particularly innovative. The inside structure is very traditionalist. They're floors, they're flat, they have walls, they're at right angles, that's fine. The revolution was on the outside. He took a traditional building and, as Luke Manan said about T.S. Eliot, he kept the basic form, but you enter this building through a curtain wall of glass. And nobody in the history of human beings had ever entered a work of architectural art in that way ever before. That was, I think, 58 was the Seagram's building, I think. And this is 1921. So 40 years earlier, 
This artist, Ernest Beau, whose patron was, in this case, a uh, styliste, uh, Coco Chanel, and she commissioned him to create a work of art for her. So he created this thing. In the side, in the interior structure of Chanel No. 5, which I'm sure you can smell, is a very traditional, beautifully built French floral. Turn of the century French floral. Primarily rose, jasmine, ylang ylang. That's fine. It's beautifully constructed. One of the um, sayings about art, you have to uh, know the rules before you can break them. Beau showed that he absolutely knew the rules. He was able to construct a gorgeous floral, okay? But then he did something revolutionary. He took his traditionalist structure and he wrapped it, just as Mies did, in a raw material that was new, created by new technology. In the 1850s, I believe, these, first, these molecules were first synthesized in a lab in Germany called aldehydes. Aldehydes are simply chains of carbon atoms. And the more atoms you have, the more the scent changes. Every atom that you add changes the smell of the aldehyde. And he took C10, so 10 atoms of carbon, C11, and C12. These smelled like nothing that anybody had ever used before. They were the first time. And perfumers were aware of them, but they had never used them. And the idea of using them was incredibly strange. It was bizarre. But he did it, and what he did was he cloaked a traditional structure in an exterior of aldehydes. You entered a traditional structure through what is, in, a in essence, an olfactory curtain wall. It seems very sort of understandable to us. It's not. It's a revolution, but you have to understand it for what it is, all right? Perfume has gone through so many schools. Uh, brutalism, proto-brutalism, was created by Germaine Cellier, who was a brilliant perfumer. Uh, I think it was 1948, was uh, Fracas. And fracas, she took tuberose, very difficult material. It's almost a flower with claws, and she put in the aggressiveness. And there's something that's extraordinary about it, because it wasn't pretty. It came out of the bottle, and it came right at you. And it was astonishing, but it was natural. And in 1998, Odor 53 was astonishing. It was created for Comme des Garçons, and it took brutalism and it, olfactory brutalism, and it really made it brutal and it turned it into something that was ferocious, and there were no natural landmarks, all right? Now, after that comes another work, Untitled, by a brilliant perfumer, Daniela Andrier, 2010. It goes back to nature. It uses a natural material called galbanum, which is a very, very strong green. But you've gone from the use of tuberose, which is entirely natural, but twisted in a, way, in a brilliant way, through Odor 53, which is entirely synthetic and meant to smell synthetic, to uh, another work, Untitled, which is this natural world, but in a way that we've never seen it before. Overpowering, almost surreal green. If you haven't experienced it, you have to experience it. You have to smell it. It's absolutely brilliant. The last work of art that we're going to do is a work that I think is fascinating. Now, Jean-Claude Elena is one of the four or five most important olfactory artists working today. Hermes is his patron. He is the in-house perfumer at Hermes, and he creates works of art for Hermes that are absolutely extraordinary. And what's interesting about him is that Elena has been going in this direction for a long time. Like most artists, he is moving on a trajectory. I think of Mark Rothko, the abstract expressionism of that. There was olfactory abstract expressionism. I think Diorama is the best example of that. Uh, Edward Rudnitska, one of the greatest olfactory artists of the mid-20th century. So we've gone neoclassicism, romanticism, modernism, abstract expressionism, through several other schools. Jean-Claude Elena is not exactly doing minimalism, but doesn't this smell different? It smells like something that's not like Jiki or Chanel No. 5 at all. It has less weight it has more light. 
It's luminous. And I think that it's a little bit unfair to call it minimalist. It's, in a sense, a sort of maximal minimalism, if you will. Elena creates these things that are phenomenally beautiful, but not in any traditional sense. When you wear beautiful perfumes, for example, L'Interdit. L'Interdit, I think, is one of the greatest underappreciated perfumes uh, around. It's a beautiful work of olfactory art, mid-20th century, but you carry it around in a very French fashion. It's a work that is beautiful, and people say, oh, your perfume smells wonderful. They are impressed with the beauty of it. And Elena, by contrast, is going for a school of perfumery where when you wear it, it's a completely different work of art. It almost absorbs into you. And you don't carry it around. You don't wear the perfume. In a sense, the perfume becomes you. And people don't say to you when you're wearing this, oh, your perfume smells beautiful. Your perfume smells wonderful. They say, you smell wonderful. <laughs> it's a completely different approach. Obviously, Elena is a master of synthetics, which today are crucially important in the art. And uh, I think that this is wonderful. This, by the way, is not on the market yet. This is Santal Masoya, and this comes on the market, I think, in a couple weeks from now. So you're getting a preview. Um, I think that it is absolutely crucial that we understand uh, that perfume is a full art. Look, another art form. Everybody, everybody agrees that film, that movies, are an art form, but they are a hugely commercialized art form. It's the same with perfume. It's hugely commercialized, but there are great movies that are commercial successes and are also works of art, and there are small movies that are works of art, and they're very, very different. They're all in the same medium. Perfume is the same. These are olfactory works of art. They speak to the sense of smell, and my job as the curator at the Department of Olfactory Art is to establish this in the mainstream of art history. I'm very much looking forward to it. I hope that you enjoyed these works of art. Thank you.